Thanks. Hi, Marissa. Ah, welcome back. It's getting later on your end. It's been a long day. <laughs> when you're talking pulsars, the energy returns. <laughs> Good news. Right, so this session will be the one where you get uh, introduced into how we do pulsar timing. Um, thereafter, there will be an exercise, but for the first bit, you, I think, sit back, relax, and enjoy, as uh, Matthew explains to you some of the important methods behind pulsar timing. Thanks, Marissa. Can you see my screen? Yep, it's showing well. Uh, we're still in the zoomed out version. Okay, let me know when you're going to start. Um, we're ranking up. We've just jumped from 32 to 48 participants. So let's give it, uh, I'll say let's give it two more minutes and then we can start. No worries. Should have been a lunch break. Yep. Um, just check this is all going to work. Looks good. Yeah, it's moving nicely. No. Uh, you see my is this font big enough to be able to yeah, read? Yeah, the my... resolutions uh, the font is big enough um to me. The resolution is not perfect, but I think it's good enough to be understood. Yeah. Right, let's just try a plot. Here we go. Is that big enough? Yeah, I see the plot. Um, yeah, PG plot's always a bit of a pain with reading the text, but the plot shows well. A bit smaller. Uh, to people that have just joined, we're just finishing uh, making sure Matthew's setup looks good and then we'll get started. But you've not missed anything yet. Okay. All right. When you're happy, I'm happy. You can kick it okay. off. Okay. Thanks, Marissa, and thanks everybody for coming back. Um, we're going to learn a little bit about pulsar timing, how we actually do some of the mechanics and look at some data. There should be some data on your virtual machines um, that you'll be playing with later on. But the first part of this lecture, you're just going to watch. Um, I th think Marissa put my data on your virtual box somewhere, but I'm not 100% sure where, but maybe in the Slack channel, she can elucidate where that is. So we're going to be talking with uh, sorry, learning this with Aditya and myself. Now I'm going to take over the first 15 minutes or so. So pulsars, as we've seen, are sources of quasi-regular pulses that are broadband. That means they span over a gigahertz of radio spectrum. And when you add the pulses together, they sum to a mean pulsar profile that by eye looks largely identical. Because every pulse is actually a little bit different, um, there is a, a bit of um, what we call jitter about the mean pulse profile. So they're not absolutely identical, but to your eye, they look near enough. And by timing the average pulses, uh, we can learn about things like how fast the pulse are spinning, how fast it's slowing down, whether or not they've had an earthquake or a star quake, which we call a glitch. We can learn a bit about the interstellar medium between us and the pulsar, as well as any orbits they're part of. We can also actually see the pulsar moving across the sky by, by timing the pulses. Um, we can work out where they are in the sky to great accuracy. And we can actually see the curvature of the wavefront 
as it washes through the solar system and measure the parallax to the pulsar. So we usually um, take the data with what used to be effectively a, a supercomputer. These days, it's usually just one computer with a graphics processing unit or two in it. And we take the gigahertz of data. Uh, we filter it to remove the effects of the interstellar medium on it in a process known as coherent dispersion. And then we sum the data in like a histogram and every rotation of the pulsar, we put the data in the same bins at the same phase of the pulsar, or at least try to. Um, so there should be a directory somewhere in your virtual box called Meerkat Tutorial, and all the data I'm going to show you is in that. So there is a command called the Pulsar Archive Viewer, or PAV, and if you say PAV, minus capital D, this means display, after scrunching in frequency and time and polarization, rotate the profile by half a turn and access the data from this archive, which is on disk. And you get something that looks like this. So there's a fairly bright pulsar. The signal to noise is 3,500. Um, it's only 90 seconds long. It has a bandwidth of 856 megahertz and the, the center frequency is near 1300 megahertz. Um, the, um, if we wanted to see more observations of this pulsar, we can go to this, this website. Um, might just Get rid of the div because it's a secret experimental version. But the pulsar we were just looking at, um, I look at mere time folded data. This is the portal pulsars.org.au. Um, and it's possible to work out what data is being obtained on what pulsar. So if we choose L band, this is between about 900 megahertz and 1700 megahertz. And we did the thousand pulsar array project, then we should be able to order the pulsars by their name. Scroll down to that 1500 pulsar, which I just had on the next page, unfortunately. Oh, or the next one. Oh, here we go. So 15, what was it? Uh, Remember its name. So I'm going to cheat. Fifteen fifty nine. There we go. Um, minus forty four thirty eight. So these are all the observations of this pulsar. If you hover over it, it tells you it's got a signal noise of ninety six hundred, and they observed it for two hundred and seventy three seconds. And then these are the changes in the signal to noise as a function of UTC. So this is the first of or October, sorry, January 2021. And if we scroll down, we can see there's lots of observations here. If I just want to find out which is, is the best, I can order it by signal to noise. Click on this um, profile here and you can see it. And this is as a function of time, it's very persistent and bright. And it's got this curious structure as a function of frequency. You can see this beautiful banding. The, lo the light from the pulsar or the radio waves are being focused at certain characteristic wavelengths that kind of amplify it. And these are uh, beautiful scintillation properties. And you can actually use um, these bandwidths and how they change to examine how the pulsar is moving across the sky. We just go back to the lecture now. Um, that command pav was, was how we saw that. Um, some Unix commands that have been uh, mentioned before. 
if you want to change directory, you do to the directory called blah, you do cd blah. If you want to look at what's in there, you do ls. If you want to see just the archive files, you do a star.ar. ls minus l gives you a long list. And here's an example of a long list. So you can see there's various files in that directory. Um, but if it has a little D here, that means it's actually a directory. So I'd have to change directory into this one to see this Pulsar or MSPs. Um, but there is this single file here, 1559. So there's actually many profiles in this archive. There's one for each frequency channel. And by default, Meerkat observes with about 1,024 frequency channels across the frequency range from 856 megahertz to twice that, I think it's 1712. So if I want to see all of those profiles, rather than having to plot all 1024, PAV comes up with this lovely minus capital G command. So this means use the Pulsar Archive Viewer to plot a grayscale after scrunching in polarization. Let's not worry too much about that now. The following file, and rotate it by 0.7 turns, just so that the sweep doesn't uh, wrap here. So you can see here the radio waves at 1700 megahertz hit the telescope first, and then right down at 850 megahertz, they came in last. And this is this one upon frequency squared delay. So every time the radio waves are coming past those electrons in the ISM, they're being delayed. And the amount they're being delayed depends on how much energy is in the radio wave. The more energetic, uh, the less effect it has on it. If you're an X-ray, you just go straight through. Um, at the lower frequencies, it gets very long delay. So this pulsar has a spin period of 257 milliseconds. So that's the time from here to there. And you can see that the delay is about probably 200 milliseconds from the top to the bottom. And that's because the dispersion constant is 56.1 parsecs per cubic centimeter. So the time delay between any two frequencies just depends on the DM and the frequencies you're observing at using this formula. Um, so often we want to reduce how much data we're looking at and we integrate in order to increase our signal to noise ratio. So what I've done here is I've scrunched the data in the frequency direction by a factor of eight by adding this minus F8 flag given to PAV. So now I'm going PAV minus F8. So that means add everything in eights. And it does a very clever little delay to take out the dispersion sweep and then do the grayscale scrunch and polarization and do the same thing. And so this looks a bit chunkier. You can see the banding here, um, but each of those profiles is, is perfectly added. If we just compare that to here, you can see it was much finer grained, but usually we wanna reduce how much data we have by integrating in either frequency or time. And so the reason we wanna do this integration is that the signal to noise ratio we're actually getting on any profile depends on how bright the source is. This is the flux density in Janskys. Think of this as how much energy per unit wave uh, bandwidth. This is the gain, the telescope gain in Kelvins per Jansky. You can think of this as how many kind of degrees Kelvin your receiver heats up by for every Jansky of flux. There's a square root sign here. And what we have here is the total amount of information. So the signal to noise ratio goes to the square root of the information, but it's proportional to your collecting area, how bright the system is and inversely proportional to how hor horribly hot the sky temperature is and also the receiver temperature. And then there's a little bonus factor at the end. If your pulsar is very narrow, you get a bonus of P take W on W. So if the width was like 1% of the period, you'd get a square root of 99 benefit here, which is about 10. 
So the reason we want to increase our signal to noise is because we want to ultimately measure the arrival times. And if the signal to noise gets of order unity in an individual frequency channel, we, we, we can't find the pulse anymore. So we scrunch it in order to, to find it. There's some other handy commands that tell you about your archive. So there's this VAP command. I don't know what it stands for, but it gives you information about your archive. And so you can say things like VAP minus little c, and then a double quote, and then keywords like name, frequency, BW is bandwidth, N sub, the number of sub integrations, number of polarizations, number of frequency channels. And if I do that on this particular file, it shows me that there's 856 megahertz of bandwidth, there's four polarizations, only one sub-integration, but 1,024 frequency channels. So we can um, assess the quality of our data by looking at it, and visualization is a very important part of science. There's a directory um, beneath that tutorial directory called MSPs, and this is from Rene Spiewak's PhD thesis. And you can look at all of the files in there. They've been frequency and time and polarization scrunched, which is why I've called them FTPs. So if you do PAV minus N 4,3, this means plot four plots by three. You could put 10,10, 10, but you wouldn't be able to see anything. You could do 1,1 1, 1, and you just get one plot. And you can see here there's a whole different a range of pulsar profiles for all these millisecond pulsars. By no means do they all look the same. And indeed, some of them don't look like pulsars at all because the signal to noise ratio is effectively nothing. Um, and those pulsars, are, we're probably either not pointing at the right spot or it's just too faint for us to see. Others have these beautiful little notches and triple peaked humps and uh, this one looks a bit like 0437, which is kind of fun. Um, others have these triple humps. And the sharper these features, the better we can time it because we can get more accurate arrival times depending on the derivative of the pulse profile. So we generate arrival times by comparing to an average profile. So what we do is we get a high signal to noise average profile. We scrunch it all the way down. Um, we generate arrival times using the PAT command. We create a timing model, which is a mathematical model of how the pulsar is rotating. This is an iterative procedure where you get a first guess, you fit some data, you update the model, you fit again, and eventually you get one that predicts literally every single, when every single pulse would arrive, not at the Earth, but at the solar system barycenter. And then finally, we use this Tempo2 um, program to fit a model to the data and display what we call the timing residuals. So this is when the data really arrived at Earth, subtracted by, um, after subtracting the model of when we thought it should arrive. So if you have a binary pulsar, and in this directory 1141, um, I've created an ephemeris where I've taken out the binary parameters. I call it playground because it's not a very good model because it doesn't have the binary in it. And then I've got this with pn.tim. These are all the arrival times and we've actually labeled when each pulse comes, which enables us to, to phase connect them. So if you run tempo two on this um, data, you can see that the arrival times go down, they start going negative, they turn around, go positive again, and go around. And this is because this pulsar is traveling around another star. So we're getting something that looks a lot like a sinusoid. It's got a little bit of deviation from sinusoidalness, if that's a word. Um, but this was observed with Meerkat over the course of about five and a bit hours. And it was actually, created for this tutorial. So I got some telescope time to, to get some data on this pulsar. And the signal to noise is so good, it looks amazingly like a sinusoid. So we can have some fun here. You can work out the orbital period by measuring the distance between 
this part of the orbit where it crosses zero and this one over here. If you do that, it's about 0.2 of a day. This is in days down here. So 0.2 of a day is 0.2 times 24, which is, what is it? Uh, 4.8 hours. Um, and we can work out the speed at which this pulsar is going projected on our line of sight. So there's something called A sine I, which is the distance from this blue line to the crest here, or the trough and the crest. Um, and so if we take this equation, the orbital velocity is two times pi times A sine I. So this is just the distance around the quasi circular orbit times the speed of light divided by the orbital period. So that's the 4.8 hours. So two times pi times 1.85 seconds times three by 10 to the eight this is the speed of light in meters per second divided by 0.2 times 24 hours in a day times 3,600 seconds in an hour. And we find out this pulsar is actually going at 200 kilometers a second, which is pretty amazing. The companion is actually going around the pulsar even faster. It's actually about 30% faster. So the mutual speed in this system is actually 464 kilometers per second. It's pretty fast. The Earth goes around the sun about 30 kilometers per second. And this is 0.15% of the speed of light. So this system has a one solar mass white dwarf being orbited by a 1.3 solar mass pulsar. And in fact, the whole or or orbit is only a little bit bigger than the sun. Um, it's got an elliptical orbit in shape. I've exaggerated a little bit here, but because the speed of gravity is just the same as the speed of light, the actual orbit here processes. And over the course of 17 years, the uh, orientation of the orbit on the sky is rotating around. Uh, it's actually 5.33 D degrees per year. And because these two stars are going around each other so quickly, they're emi emitting gravitational waves and the orbit shrinking again by about the three millimeters per orbit. And in about a billion years, the white dwarf and the neutron star will tear each other apart. And this is an, an ideal Lisa source for that. So that's the end of my lecture. I'm just going to show you um, some of the data reduction using this um, terminal here. So I'm currently in the Meerkat tutorial. I think Marissa's posted where you you look at this. So let's yeah, maybe just... I'll um, Matthew. I'll just interrupt you here to make sure if people did not read the Slack. So this is again in the virtual machine and. Uh, in the exercise directory that you've been visiting in the in the shared directory before in there you've got all the lectures labeled and so this data lives in the lecture 5 directory if this is your first time going into that lecture 5 directory you will see that the way the the file is saved there is a tar file again called workshop.tar.gs and so you just have to run thank you matthew for bringing that up you just have to run that um that's maybe not so useful uh, if you can close that window. Matthew will look at what I um, wrote in red just at the top there. Yes, if you can just ah. run that tar command there, then you will immediately have access to the subdirectory structure that Matthew is now describing. So once you've done that, um, I can, you will have, um, let me look up here, what's your base directory is called? Meerkat tutorial, is it? Yeah. So you'll get a, a directory from that command called meerkat underscore tutorial. And that is where Matthew is now. Should we pause just for two minutes, Matthew, and uh, let everybody uh, open up their windows? Yeah, so on my computer, which is on the Swinburne supercomputer, it's the same from meerkat underscore tutorial, but prior to that, it isn't. So don't go to this directory or it won't end well. If you get into that directory properly and you do ls, you should see three 
um, files. One is an archive and two are directories. And then while you're just getting there, I will um, plot um, this pulsar's data and you can see the um, dispersion sweep, which looks nice. When it gets to here, it wraps around back to the start. I can take out the dispersion suite by adding the minus little d command. And then if you do that, it might take a little while for your computer to do it. Um, you can now see that the pulse is nicely straightened. And I can rotate it by 0 0.5 just so it doesn't get, it's kind of ugly that it's kind of not in so the So maybe middle. let's just have some thumbs up if you are able to um, get into that directory. Uh, there's a reactions button on Zoom. So if I can get a couple of thumbs ups, it will at least give me confidence that people have been able to locate to the data. Okay, there's one word statement saying gotten it. Thanks, that's that's great. Um, how about the rest of you? I see three thumbs ups, four now. So it's increasing. Ah, super cool. Ah, grand. Okay, because it's really nice to plot these things yourself. As Matthew say, says, there might be some delay for the graphs to populate, but still, as he talks, you can see them be generated. And so you can zoom in the x direction with a minus z if you want to so this means the comma here is anything that takes two arguments we tend to use the commas and so i've zoomed in now and you can see these beautiful little synth bands and if you want to understand what all the different options for pav are you can do pav minus h and so um there's all sorts of things you can plot. Um, I can zoom to a frequency range with the minus K option. So let's try that. So I can do minus K. Um, and it looks kind of brightest down the bottom here. So we might do from say 850 to 950 megahertz or something. Let's go 875, 950. Drum roll. <laughs> sure, drum roll. Oh, gosh. You can see the little synth bands, which is all kind of cute. All right, so that was um, in this directory. There's only one, one file there. If we go now to the MSPs directory, there's oodles of files here and we're sort of thinking, huh, which of these are remotely interesting? So there is a command PSR stat. And if I do minus little c SNR for signal to noise, and then I do two star dot FTP, it calculates for each one what the signal to noise ratio is of these files. Now, if I add minus capital Q, it gets rid of the yucky equal sign. And now you can see that in the second column, some of these have quite big signal to noises, others are quite low. So I can do something clever by, I can pipe to orc and say, if dollars two is greater than a thousand, it's worthy of this tutorial. So I can go print, and if I go dollar zero, it'll print the whole thing. So every one of these that's bigger than a thousand is now being reported to the screen. Um, if instead of seeing dollar zero, I say dollars one, I'll just get their names. So 
So let's just dwell on this for a second because I did it all pretty fast because I'm such a pulsar god. So it's PSR stat minus C SNR. So give me the signal noise of all the files and use the minus Q so I don't get the horrible signal to noise ratio equals. Pipe that the response of that to the awk command. And all awk commands start with this little quote bracket. And then I do a, a statement if parentheses, if the second thing is greater than a thousand, print the first thing. So I do that, I get all the names. And now I can do something which is even more amazing. I can put back quotes around this and give it to pav and say minus D. And what it'll do is it'll plot each one in turn. There's uh, 2241. I can hit return and I'll get the next guy. You can see he's got some beautiful little notches and structures. 2145, an old fame, an old favorite of mine, Bales et al, 1994, I think it is. Uh, it's got little, these little notches. It's one of the brightest pulsars in time by virtually everybody because it's near the equator. Um, here's another one, 0125, recently discovered um, by the Green Bank Telescope, I think it was. This one's got all sorts of little funny features and it has almost no what we call baseline. So it's almost never off. Uh, this pulsar is a long way away. And um, I think it's in a mildly eccentric orbit. 1713, this is a very famous pulsar discovered by Fernando Camillo, who now works at Soraya. And it's one of the brightest millisecond pulsars in the sky. Um, here's another one with lots of interesting features. So the sharper the features and the better the signal to noise, the more accurately we can, we can time it. So if I wanted to, I could up arrow, uh, whoops. I could go minus N three comma three or something like that, or four comma three. And this, what time I'd get 12 at once to look at them. You can quickly scan through and go, wow, who's this guy? Nice and narrow, 1909. Mm -hmm. You can just get a, a feel for what they look like. Some have the triple humps, double humps, some are just solitary, some have these little interesting features. We unfortunately don't know a lot why these pulsars have such curious um structures in them but all we really care about is if we use them as a tool is, is how sharp they are so i might just finish up and hand back to the teacher in a second with 1141 which was that binary pulsar so the tempo 2 command um requires a graphics plugin called PLK. And then I say the ephemeris is my playground. And then my arrival times are this with PN. And if I do that, hopefully, just calculating all sorts of wondrous things about barocentric arrival times and here is the pulses as they would have appeared at the Barry Center if I didn't have the binary modeling. So you can see it goes down and up. This program, is a, the learning curve is a little bit steep. We've got um, the day down here. I can plot orbital phase instead. So this is from orbital phase zero back to one. You can see it's a nice kind of quasi sinusoidal shape. Um, or I could plot the what was it? Uh, day of year. So this was actually on January the 3rd by the looks of it. Um, and it's possible to kind of zoom in on 
different parts of the data to have a look at it in a little bit more detail by doing Z and then Z again. And you can actually see if you do this, that the error bar on the point is a lot, or the scatter is a lot bigger than the data. This is not because the pulsar is traveling around in some wild orbit. This is because the pulses coming off the pulsar are not sufficiently stable to give a perfect arrival time. And so this is what we call pulse jitter. And it's quite bad for this pulsar because it's, it's so slow. Anyway, um, at this point, I might hand over to my faithful sidekick, Aditya. Are you ready to take it away, Aditya? Thanks, Matthew. Um, yeah, so I think before we get started with all of the tutorials, uh, I just want to get a quick poll again. Uh, from people by a quick thumbs up saying how many people have gotten this up and running. Can I see some thumbs up? I can see one, two. Aditya, awesome. if I may interject, yeah. um, I just want to set people at ease that, um, that it would have been very hard for you to actually uh, run these commands um, while also paying attention to the lecture. So, Matthew ran us through it to give a nice overview of what all the options are. Um, so if, if you've been struggling to decide what to focus on, we'll now switch gears to having you work in the virtual machine. So um, now is a good time to, to make sure you can actually access the, uh, the data that Aditya is talking about, because he will go uh, through it with you command by command. Thanks, Aditya. <laughs> 